You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast, season number three, episode 25. The 2024 Cubs season is upon us. Don't forget to listen, download, review, most importantly, subscribe to the podcast, follow us on the socials. Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram. Of course, you can see us on Facebook and you can email Crowley and I, fly the W670 at gmail.com. Crowley, happy end to the end of Cactus League play, which means opening day is right around the corner. The stars at night are big and bright. I am in Texas here. I'm in Texas waiting opening day. I am ready, Dustin. This is, I'm getting excited. That's all I can say. This is the first time I've ever been to Texas and I'm looking forward to going to Arlington and uh, cheering the Cubbies on, on that very first game of the season. Now you're going on the opener and on Saturday then, is that right? Yeah. Correct. You will not find me on TV on the opener, but on Saturday, look for me because um, we have like 500 people in the section behind the Cubs uh, dugout. So we're nice. going to, there's, we're going to be hard to miss. So it, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then I get on a plane Sunday and then go straight to Wrigley for the home opener. Home opener. Yeah. We're now, we're now let's talk about the home opener for a couple of minutes because before the next time we're together, we are going to be talking about the, uh, not only the, road opener, but we'll be talking probably about the home opener as well, based on how the uh, schedule is laid out. So if people want to uh, experience a home opener Crawley style, how exactly does one uh, experience Cubs home opener Crawley style? Well, you got to get there early. You want to try to get there. I usually start kind of bouncing around um, a lot of different, I know 670, the score will be down there. A lot of different people will be setting up parties all over at the bars. So usually first beer cracks around 9 a.m. Uh, you start walking around, going place to place, and then revisiting old friends. And after a few hours of that, you know, you I always like to eat outside of the ballpark. I, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I've been eating levy food for about like 40 years. So I, I usually kind of try to find something outside, get, get myself something to eat, and then head in usually right there. But uh, the festivities are always great. The Cubs do a great job on opening day. Now, and do you like after- to make sure you get in there for, you know, introducing everybody and everything, right? You don't miss yeah. anything. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I get, I don't miss anything. I get in. Um, I try to get in like maybe like 12 30 ish would probably be around the time, but I like when, when Jeremiah Pep Rocky announces the players and they line up on the, you know, on the first and the third base side and all that fun stuff. So, um, you know, I, I can't wait to hear like, you know, who gets cheered. I mean that Cody Bellinger is probably going to be like an explosion by the fans. Right. So that, that to me is a lot of fun. I, I, I love every moment of it. And I don't want to miss a second of opening day. Very, very cool. Very cool. All right. So let's get on to the business at hand. And that is a wrap of the Cactus League play. We've got a little bit more action to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was some interesting events that have happened in the last couple of days as far as it goes. But Dustin, for me, especially when you get to this last week of Cactus play, you know, you wonder how much each at bat, each inning pitched, how much the Cubs are still trying to evaluate players for the last remaining roster spots. On Thursday, the Cubs beat the Rockies five to two. The Rockies got on the board first when Drew Smiley came into the game and went two innings. He gave up three hits, two runs with two Ks. He gave up a two-run homer to put the Cubs down two to nothing. Dustin, Smiley's pitched 13.2 innings this spring, and he's given up 12 earned runs and five home runs. I'm no mathematician, but that's roughly one run per inning that he gives up and one home run every three innings. So... Ugh, that's I'm, probably why he's going to be starting in the bullpen as opposed to starting in the rotation while he's trying to, he clearly is still trying to work some things out. Yeah. And, and I think that it works out better that way, but he's not, you know, the longer he's in, the more he's going to get tagged. If he's in for one inning, you, you, you hope that he could just get through that without giving up any runs. Now um, it, the Cubs got one back in the fourth when Dominic Smith hit a double to make it two to one and tied it in the eighth on a Liam Spence single. Then in the ninth, Cole Roeder, who's had himself a nice spring, hit a three run blast to give the Cubs a five two win. Another tough performance by Smiley, Smiley and another strong start by Don Smith. You know, we're going to talk in the third segment about roster decisions, but both of those guys, you know, their performances, not just that game, but just in general, you know, it, it, you, it reflects on what's happening right now. Uh, on Friday, the Cubs played a split squad game with the Giants as Justin Steele took what was supposed to be his last tune-up start before opening day. But then to the horror of every Cub fan, Justin Steele was hit in the knee by the leadoff batter on a comebacker in the second inning, and he had to come out of the game 
Dustin, how sick to your stomach were you when you saw that? Yeah, I was uh, really worried. It uh, really bothersome. Um, not that I didn't think he should be out there, right? I mean, he has to keep getting uh, tuned up, but about the worst possible thing you could see as a Cub fan. Yeah, and, and, and you know, when you look at this, I don't – I think the Cubs still need an ace, another – bona fide ace. I would love them to get Jordan Montgomery. I don't think that's happening, but if you're telling me you don't have Justin Steele, I mean, there's no chance. There's no chance you win the NL Central if Justin Steele is out for any period of time. Right. Correct. Absolutely correct. And I agree with you. While I like the trajectory right now uh, of Justin Field, of Justin Steele, <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Justin Steele, um, I, I don't think he's quite there yet as far as, as the ace. Right. He's, you know, one season does not make an ace. You got to prove it again. And that's what 2024 is all about. I think Justin knows that just as much as anyone else. Luckily, he was able to alleviate the fears of Cub fans with this funny tweet right here. I'm okay. My bracket is not. So I was able, <laughs> able to take a breath after seeing that, but whew, you know, that, that was, that was a little bit something. Um, couple other pitchers that weren't feeling great at Sloan that day was Hayden Wesniski. He went point two innings pitch, gave up three walks two hits and four runs with only one K Luke little who hadn't given up a run all spring. He's been phenomenal. Gave up three runs on three hits and two walks. You know, Dustin, that happens just some days you just don't have it. But if you look at the body of Luke's work over the spring, I mean, it, it has been really spectacular. So, you know, you just chalk it up to one bad performance. Everybody has them. Everybody has them. Everybody. This is the time to get them out of the way. Hopefully too. Right. Right. And uh, unfortunately the Cubs offense struggled scoring three runs, going two for 11 with runners in scoring position with nine K's Michael Bush and Cole Roeder each drove in a run and the Cubs scored on a wild pitch, but they lost this one's the seven to three. But the only thing anyone cared about was Justin Steele's knee, which we said looks to be okay. Now the offense wasn't missing in the second game of that split squad on the same day on Friday as the Cubs scored 10 runs, Dustin, in the first two innings. That was amazing. By that was amazing. Yeah. That say a Suzuki grand slam. I mean, God looking good. Um, unfortunately the pitching struggled as Javier Saad gave up five runs in 3.2 innings, but only two of those were earned. Uh, a few of those unearned runs came on an error by Christopher Morrell who was making a play at third. He tripped over the third base bag and he airmailed a throw that went over the first base dugout. Uh, Dustin, I'd be lying if I didn't say that his defense is still probably one of the biggest concerns for me going into this season. Well, there's no doubt about that. And I was going to kind of try to be cute. Has uh, Christopher Morrell, has he allowed, given up more errors or has Drew Smiley given up more earned runs so far in spring training? I would say it's pretty even. Pretty and, close, and neither, right? Neither, Unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, neither neither one of these are good things. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it is pretty close. Now, Thomas Pannone got shelled as well. He went three innings, gave up five runs, uh, four in the fourth, and the Cubs, who were up ten nothing, would go on to lose this one, thirteen to twelve, with the Giants winning on an error by pitcher Chase Watkins. But say it was two for four. Dansby Swanson, I think he's had a great spring, two for three. Matt Shaw two for four and David Peralta four for four with three RBI. So like Dom Smith Peralta trying to make the Cubs opening day roster. Now Saturday's game for me was exciting because against the Brewers, because Ben Brown got the start and Dustin, he didn't disappoint. He went four innings, gave up two hits, one walk and three K's. That one walk is key. And that's true with all these young Cubs pitchers, whether we're talking about uh, ben Brown, or whether we're talking about Luke Little or Daniel Palencia, you go ahead and name it. You you got to keep those walks down. And when what you saw on Sunday from Ben Brown is what gets Cub fans excited. When he keeps when he has that control like that, he he to me, he looks like a bona fide ace. A, 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 how about a front of the line rotation? Pitcher? Front of the line, yeah, front of the line. Let's let's not jump ahead too quick, but yeah, <laughs> definitely front front of the line. Absolutely front front of the line, no doubt about it. Now the Cubs lost this one seven to four as Daniel Plencia gave up five runs in the seventh, but the Ben Brown performance to me, like, like I said, I have a feeling Dustin, he is going to be uh, called upon to start this season. That's going to happen. I have no yeah. doubt. It's just, point a, just, a, it just when not if, right. Right. And so when I take a look at that and I I'm watching that it's, I think that the Cubs right now have two guys that, could be again front of the line rotation, and that's going to be uh, Ben Brown and also Cade Horton. 
And so if, if the Cubs can develop aces, when's the last time you think that's happened, Dustin? Is true aces? I mean, yeah. are we thinking Kerry Wood and Mark Pryor? I guess. It's got to go back to then. But nothing in between. I can't think of anything in between, that's for sure. So the Cubs have one more game today in Cactus League. And, Dustin, all week we've had a ton of roster decisions. Craig Council gave some updates on a couple of injuries the Cubs have been dealing with. Um, and this is from our guy, Andy Martinez. Wisdom will start on the IL. James Tyone will be out until at least mid-April. He's thrown a bullpen today, but again, this is like he's starting spring training. He's going to need time to build it back up. Who knows how much time he needs, if he's going to, you know, how that's going to work. And then today on Sunday when we're recording this, Nick Magical hopes to get into a minor league game on Sunday. So all of those things are going to affect, you know, how, how the Cubs do it. Another thing, Dustin, that's interesting David Peralta will stay back in Arizona when the season begins. Uh, he's going to be on a throwing program. He has not played the field this spring. But, Dustin, when you look at the guy, he's been hitting the snot out of the ball. I mean, he looks yep. – he's always been a professional hitter. He's hes a guy that really just – I don't know. I, I'm looking at him, and I'm like, boy, do you want to lose that guy because of, of just every, every time he's up? It, and, and, you know, you got to think he's been injured. He's recovering from injury. Dustin, he's seven for 16. He has one home run, a double, a triple, five RBIs. I mean, that's pretty darn good, I would say. <laughs> yeah, if he could if he could carry that over, that would be a hell of uh that'd be hell of production for for a uh, DH, right? Right. So just something to kind of consider. Uh on Thursday, the Cubs optioned Daniel Palencia to triple A while four non-rastier invitees were assigned to minor league camp. That was Colton Brewer. Dick Lovelady, uh, Thomas Pannone, and David Bodie, we all knew wasn't going to make it. On Friday, Dustin, Dom Smith was scratched from the lineup. Another guy who's had a really, really good spring, and Matt Mervis took his place. And we found out shortly after that Dom Smith is opting out of his contract. He went nine for 26. He had one home run, three RBIs. He hit 346. So he is going to try to catch on with some other team, and I'm sure some other team is going to pick him up. He had a great spring. Yep, absolutely. And again, he's just kind of blocked, right? I mean, there's just really nowhere for him to be on this current Cubs roster. Right. Both non-roster invitees, catcher Joe Hudson and Jorge Alfaro, were told they would not make the opening day roster. That wasn't surprising. Uh, but we did get news that Garrett Cooper – will make the major league roster. Cooper has looked great. Again, all-star in 2022. I don't know how the Cubs got him so easily. You know what I mean? Nobody else right. had a need it's like for this Everybody play. was like asleep that day that he got put uh, put out there, except for uh, Carter and Jed. That's what it seems like. Right. I, I, I'm, this has been probably one of the strangest off-season I can remember in a long time. Uh, Cooper's gone six for 26 with two home runs, five RBIs. So, you know, a really good guy to have especially with that Patrick wisdom news, right? So he's essentially going to be the right-handed platoon guy with um, Michael Bush. Yep. So, you know, and then you could have him as a DH. There's a lot you can do. And, you know, with Caleb Killian going to be put on the 60 day IL, you don't have to make a 40 man roster decision, which makes life a little bit easier for uh, Jed and Carter. Right, get things going, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, you don't have to lose somebody. You don't have to worry about who we got to cut from the 40-man roster, and then once you cut somebody, other teams get a shot to grab them. You don't have to do any of that. Everybody gets to stay. On Saturday, Dustin, heartbreak for me. Carl Edwards Jr. opted yeah. out of his deal. Uh, he, he looked really good. So, I, I mean, you know, he, I, he came on the Fly the W podcast last, you know, when I came for when I was in Arizona, he was great to me. Um, when we were at the Club 400 tent in Mesa, Carl's always, he's been to Club 400, uh, we took this big photo in front of this uh, old style can and he photo bombed it. It was absolutely hilarious uh, from everything I've heard. Like the, they loved him in the clubhouse, good leader. Um, but in honesty, man, it, it just, he, he, you know, he knows he has an opportunity to get a more sure thing somewhere else. Now, Craig council also started to look at the announced the pitching rotation, not who would pitch what games, but who is in the starting rotation and Dustin, we got a little bit of surprise here, right? A little bit. Now, we all knew Steel Hendricks <laughs> and Shoda. That was no doubt about that. Right. And we assumed Jordan Wicks. And I think a lot of people assumed it was going to be Drew Smiley. We were talking before on an earlier podcast about a four-lefty rotation. 
uh, with Jamison Tyone, you know, gone. But council said that Javier Assad would be the starter along with Wicks and that Smiley would start the season in the pen. Um, you know, obviously Smiley went to driveline. He did everything he could to try and get back into that starter's role. Here's what Drew Smiley had to say about the decision to be in the bullpen. I mean, it was a pretty short conversation, but I'm excited. You know, I'm excited for the opportunity to to help the team. Um, I think it's something I could be really good at, you know, something I could thrive in. And I think we're really deep this year. I think the bullpen is one of our strengths, to be honest. Um, last year, I feel like we kind of relied on three, four people, you know, most of the season, and, and there's a lot of wear down near the end. I think this year, there's a lot of guys that can fill a lot of different roles, so I think we're, we're really deep. I think it's something our team can, can really kind of build on. Um, pitching out of the bullpen is just a different mindset, you know, like, I think you pitch differently, you feel different, you know, coming in later in the game, you attack guys different. Right now, my, my game plays better as a reliever. Um, I don't think it's something where I, I'm sad I'm not starting. You know, like I started 10, 10 years in this league, and I don't think I'm closing the door on that. But I also think it's, like I said, I feel like this is an opportunity to, to go out and uh, I think working with counsel, I can, I can provide a lot of value in the bullpen. So being a professional, saying all the right things, um, I agree with him. His game plays better now as a reliever than a starter. But Craig Council went out of his way to say that Drew Smiley will get some starts this season. Yeah, it's not over for him. I mean, and again, when you've got guys like Wicks and Assad, I mean, I'm hoping that everything works out. And you've also got a uh, a, a pitcher pitching in the big leagues and the American League side of things for the first time. Anything can happen. And it's good to have a guy like Smiley who's going to carry himself like a professional as backup cover. Now, Dustin, one more thing on this pitching rotation situation here is my friend, Arizona Phil. I spent a lot of time on the backfields talking to him when I was in Mesa. He had a note that said this, if Smiley moves to the pen, he will probably not reach a $3 million performance bonus he would receive if he hits 110 innings pitch. So if Smiley hits 110 innings pitch, it's in his contract, he would get an extra $3 million. So with the Cubs being up so close to the luxury tax, that first tier luxury tax, like they are this right at it, yep. right at it to not have to pay that $3 million could really pay dividends. So I don't know, Dustin, I'm curious what you think. Do you think that you know, uh, that Craig Council saw what we saw where the, the he was giving up a lot of home runs and just wasn't very, didn't look really great out there. And that was the decision that let's go with Assad instead. Or do you think that Jen Carter might have said something or even with Craig Council, because Craig Council's in on those discussions. I, I, I think that his performance allowed it to make the decision easier, but I wonder how much they were thinking about that performance bonus. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that they're thinking about that stuff. At least I. I hope they're not. I don't. I don't. I hope that doesn't go into um, th those kinds of decisions at this point in the season. You are listening to the Fly the W six seventy podcast. It is season number three. It's episode number twenty five. The Cubs season is upon us. Don't forget to listen, download, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast, and don't forget to leave those five-star reviews. In this segment, Crowley interviews Hall of Famer and one of my all-time favorites, if not my all-time favorite, Andre Dawson, to talk about what it takes for hitters to get ready during spring training and to talk about the upcoming Andre Dawson bourbon tasting event at Rizzo's across from Wrigley Field on April 4th. Our very own Crowley will be emceeing this event. You don't want to miss it. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, it is my pleasure, it is my honor to have on the Hall of Famer, the Hawk, Andre Dawson. Andre, how are you today? Very well, thank you. And yourself? I am doing well. I'm excited because a opening day is coming up. The Cubs opener is April 1st at Wrigley Field, and that very same week, you're going to be in town doing a great bourbon tasting at Rizzo's across from Wrigley Field on April 4th. So I am excited about the Cubs coming back to town, and I'm excited about Andre Dawson coming to town. Well, I'm excited also uh, at the start of this baseball season, just a week away. And, you know, I look forward to it. I look forward to getting back to opening day 
and you know seeing uh, the team. I was out in spring training briefly, and I didn't get to really see too much. Only actually a game and a half, but um, very upbeat. Everybody, um, I was looking forward to um, you know getting out of Arizona and getting the season started. And they open up in Texas, as we all know, but I'm looking forward. I won't be there. I'm looking forward to opening day. I will be in Chicago. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, as a player, what was what did you do to, in spring training? What was the most important thing for you to get yourself ready for the season? Well, I got myself ready for the season prior to spring training. And that was, you know, most of my conditioning and strengthening of the joints, especially the arm. Uh, spring training uh, was a necessary month to get your rhythm, your timing. Uh, when it you know came to uh, performing offensively, so playing in the games, uh, all of I would play in all of about thirty plus odd games or so, and you know each day you go out, uh, you do something that prepares you for day one of the regular season. And for me, the most part was getting the kinks out, uh, making sure that uh, my rhythm was where I wanted to be, the timing was on. And that's what, you know, I geared myself in spring training for. The off season was conditioning and that sort of thing, but, you know, playing the games and recreating that familiarity uh, itself was what I looked forward to in spring training. Now, how big of a part is it at spring training as getting to know the team and starting to gel as a group? Well, there are always changes, of course, uh, during the course of the off season. Uh, there are there are trades, there are free agents that are signed, there are new players uh, that come aboard and are given a look. So, uh, again, the familiarity of the individuals that you're around, getting to know them their makeup, you know, how you're going to perhaps gel together as a ball club. All that plays an important role during that one month session. And that's a big part. That's a big and integral part of, you know, how you get out of the blocks and how you gear yourself for the season itself. Now, I remember in 1989, the boys of Zimmer, that spring training did not go good. Did you guys as a team really worry about the results of spring training or did not <laughs> Get in your head too much? Not really. You don't. You don't worry about a lot that go on during spring training, other than the fact that hopefully you don't have too many injuries. Uh, but the season is a different monster. Um, we were a team that was a mixture of some seasoned veterans, and we had some young players uh, who were trying to not only just make the ball club, but make the starting lineup. And that proved to be pivotal as far as that season was concerned because we had two players who sort of battled it out for the Rookie of the Year award who played a a very pivotal part in the success of the team. So you don't really uh, draw too much conclusion about spring training. You just hope that you can break camp and you're healthy. And that's when the bell rings and, you know, you sort of become a different kind of ball player. Now, Andre, the as I said, Wrigley opening day, you're going to be there, I'm going to be there April 1st, but especially for fans in the Chicagoland area, and I know a lot of people that also come and they spend that first week at Wrigley Field just getting in all that opening week vibes, there's going to be a special event at Rizzo's, which is across the street from Wrigley Field on Thursday, April 4th from 6 to 10 p.m., and you have a bottle of bourbon that is for sale, and this is really exciting. Uh, tell our listeners about Cooperstown Brewery and Distillery and how you got involved with them. Yes, I entered into an agreement uh, with Cooperstown Brewery. Uh, they wanted to um, sort of invent a bourbon, of all things, and I'm not really a drinker, uh, but uh, the theme seemed to fit very well. Cooperstown, um, Andre Dawson, being that I'm in the Hall of Fame there, and uh, the concept that they had. Uh, from what I understand, a lot of people uh, who have tasted, tested, tried it, 
uh, who are bourbon drinkers seem to like it. I can't really tell you what it tastes like because I'm not a drinker. But the event itself, again, like you said, is going to be Thursday. And I was happy, you know, when they uh, approached me to be a part of it. There are some other athletes uh, throughout the, the uh, uh, sports industry uh, who have ties to Cooperstown and who worked uh, with them in similar projects. And when they reached out to me uh, specifically in particular, yes, I was, uh, I was excited about uh, the prospect of coming aboard and working with them. So if you are going to the event, each attendee is going to receive one bottle of Andre Dawson Elite Limited Edition Bourbon. And I actually have a bottle of it here, Andre. I keep one for display and then one is top shelf for when I have special guests in the Cubs cave. And this is what it looks like. The one that are the, each attendee is going to get is actually going to have a metal plate on it and you sign each of those. Is that correct? That's correct. And I sort of looked at it like a collectible in a sense, um, you know, because of uh, the bottle design being that of a baseball and then with the uh, label, the plate on the face of it being autographed by me. Uh, so that was, you know, the first concept I drew from it. But of course, there are those drinkers out there who are going to want to know what it tastes like and going to open the bottle. So there are not that many of them, from what I understand, but there's going to be a reproduction and hopefully, you know, this, this thing can take off. Well, the bourbon, like I said, is produced by Cooperstown Distillery. And we did a very small tasting before this big one at Rizzo's. It was so popular. People said, look, this was great. But, you know, we did it at the Club 400 condo and, and, and so many people didn't get on that invite list. They were disappointed. And so we said, okay. Let's go someplace bigger. Let's go Rizzo's. So you are literally in the shadow of Wrigley Field. And as you mentioned before, this right here, this picture right up here, this is what the attendees are going to get. And if you're on the 670 The Score YouTube channel, you can see it's the same thing. It's the bottle, except there's a metal plate. Andre signs that. And then there's other bourbons from Cooperstown Distillery that are going to be available to test. And I can tell you, Andre, that, you know, I'm not the biggest bourbon connoisseur, but I know a good bourbon. And this was absolutely delicious. There was no burn to it, high quality, and it's rated 95 out of 100. So, I mean, I know you, Andre, you don't want to, you know, just slap your name on any old thing. This is high quality. And the fact that Cooperstown Distillery is so well known in New York, it, it goes to show you, you know, what the attendees are going to get if they come to the event. Yeah. Well, you know, of course not being a drinker um I, I don't drink alcohol I, I did question um first what does it taste like um and and do people like it do they enjoy drinking it uh and i understand bourbon can be a strong drink and there's a specific way you to drink it i've been told you you got to mix ice cubes with it but i wanted to know definitely that it was going to be something that people were going to like and enjoy before I wanted to move forward with it. Right. And so these bottles retail for 125, but if you come to the event, all attendees, they get to taste the Andre Dawson bourbon. You each attendee will meet you post a post for a photo with you. And then they get the bottle of bourbon photo taken with their cell phones. And that's what I did last time. If you see this picture right here, there's me and you at the club 400 condo. And I have the bottle of bourbon right there. And, you know, we just had so much fun last time tasting these bourbons. And, you know, we, we got, to, you know, you tell some stories. There's going to be a QA, and a which I'm going to be hosting. It's a 20-minute q and I'm going to tell some stories. We're going to take some questions from the audience. How much fun do you have telling some of those stories of the past? <laughs> it just reminds me of, you know, the past and uh, the times, actually. And but most important, you know, I, I really get a kick out of uh, the fans uh, just mixing, and mingling with them. And, you know, they even have stories and, and listening to some of that. But I enjoy that uh, because there's, there's there's not a fan like a Cub fan. <laughs> and when you get the opportunity to just, you know, spend that that kind of cozy moment with them. I look forward to it. It's exciting. It's fun. 
And, you know, it makes for a pleasant, enjoyable uh, evening and event. And, and Andre, not only are they going to get to, you know, get the bourbon, get the photos, get, you know, get to taste the bourbon and listen to the Q and a, you will sign one item personally autograph. You're going to, you're going to autograph for it. So the, if, if any attendee, they bring an item and you will sign it. And Andre, I, I I'm going to admit, I have a lot of items that got signed for me over the years. <laughs> I'll tell you why though. Here, here's a, here's a 16 by 20 I have of you. And you actually told me how it should, what inscription should be on there. You actually said, I recommend this. I went with your recommendations, got your rookie of the year and MVP on it. This was a baseball that you signed with the hall of fame inscription. And then this is one of the pieces in my collection that I, I cherish. There's only 15 of these made where we'll tell the story at the event. Cause you know, I, I don't want to keep you too long, but the blank contract. But when you look at your writing, how important was it for you to, you know, now some of the days I see autographs and I can't even make out who it is. Your autograph is, to me is easily a top three autograph as far as any sports autograph. Well, I, I guess I should take a lot of pride in it because uh, my, one of my aunts, my first grade teacher used to keep me after class and she would make me write on the chalkboard. Now, this, you're talking about first grade, and I not only wrote in manuscript, but she taught me how to write cursive as a first grader. And I thought it was a form of punishment uh, because everybody else was going home. But I later on saw the significance in it. And yes, I, I really take a lot of pride in it. I take my time with it. You know, I'm, I'm never in a rush for anything anyway. But uh, I think it's something that, you know, if a fan requests that, at least make it legible so they can uh, some sort of way make out what it should say. And, you know, for me, I don't just like to let just throw anything on whatever it is, a ball, a photo, or a bat. I want it to be legible. And not only that, you're one of those people that you you always are very kind to the people when, when they come to get things signed. You talk to them, you listen to their stories. You don't just rush them out of the way. And I love that about you. Well, I appreciate that because, hey, it's, it's just another game without the fans. Right. And so, Andre, I mean, again, we're, we're talking about a your every attendee is going to get one of these bottles of bourbon rated 95 out of 100 from Cooperstown Distillery. $125 retail. They're going to get to taste it. They're going to get to, to post for pictures with their cell phones. They're getting one item signed personally by you. And not only that, you got a Q and a sec session and we're going to be ruffling off some signed Andre Dawson items. So some lucky attendees are going to come home with even more stuff from you. So this is really an event that is, is, is we're raising money for charity to benefit club 400 charities Cub fans helping Cub fans. My friend, Stuart McVicker, uh, Andre, I know you've done a couple events with Stuart and you know that Stuart always puts on top notch events. Yeah, he do. And, uh, he, I got to give him a lot of credit for that. He really extends himself, um, when it comes to that and need to be a little bit, a few more people like him around. I a hundred percent agree with you. If our listeners are interested and would like to come to this event, I'll be there. Stewart will be there. And obviously the hall of famer, Andre Dawson's going to be there. And the guys from Cooperstown distillery is going to be there to kind of talk about the distilling process, which is really, really cool. All you have to do is get your tickets at www.club400cubs.com. That's www.club400cubs.com. I'm going to tweet the link out. I'm going to put it out on Facebook. Anyone that's interested, but to me, Andre, this event on Thursday, April 4th at Rizzo's, right on Clark Street, right across from Wrigley Field from 6 to 10 p.m. is going to be the perfect event for opening day week. Wouldn't you agree? I think so. Uh, like I said, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it uh, probably just as much as I'm looking forward to opening day. And I especially wanted to extend – you know, the three days they yeah, being in Chicago, knowing that this event was going to be put on uh, for the purpose, uh, not only just for opening day, but for the event itself. Well, I thank you so much, Andre, for coming on the fly, the W, and I will see you April 4th at Rizzo's. You got it. 
This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's episode number 25 of season number three. The Cubs season is upon us. Don't forget, listen, download, subscribe, and leave Crowley and I one of those five-star reviews. All right, Crowley, so we had a little disturbing news as uh, Major League Baseball got underway in Korea. Could this th- this couldn't have been any worse for MLB? Well, it could know. have been worse. It could have been worse. It could have <laughs> it, the, the story could have broke like in LA, and the NCAA tournament could have not been going on, and that would that, have actually been true. worse for them because um, not that it's going away, but that would have really made it something. Well, for our listeners, obviously, I think everybody knows, but the story breaks in Korea that Shohei Otani's like best friend interpreter Ipe Misuhara was gambling and is is part of a federal probe on gambling and that there was money that that Shohei Otani was uh sent to this bookie to cover the losses of his friend and translator Misuhara and so this is going to be a mess Dustin because they didn't get there it doesn't seem to me that they got their story straight and my guess is that they spoke before talking to lawyers because you know Misahara came out first thing he says it was me I was gambling I did not gamble on baseball um I didn't know this that or the other yada da, yada Shohei was very mad at me but he wired the money to cover my bets right well after the lawyers kind of got a hold of that uh, Shohei's lawyers they then all of a sudden the story changed Shohei did not cover any bets for his friend his friend stole the money to pay off the bets and so the Dodgers did fire him, but but Dustin, this this smells bad. Oh, it, it's got all kinds of stinkiness um, all over it. I mean, all all over it. Um, don't like it one little bit. There's something going on. The, the story from the interpreter has changed now three times, right? Three right. three times. So that's pretty uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, something something stinks and. Um, this is a bad, bad uh, uh, weekend for uh, Rob Manfred. There's no doubt about that. And Dustin, it took 48 hours for a comment from MLB on, on this huge story. And then when they finally announced that they're doing an investigation, it's on a Friday afternoon dump. You know all about the Friday afternoon. Oh, yeah. yeah, I and know about that. that yeah. You mentioned it right in the middle of March Madness. So let's just kind of eh, push that off there. No big deal, right? Right. Yeah. Trying to hide from it. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a bad look and this isn't going away. And I just hope this isn't, um, this isn't something where they have to sit, uh, sit Otani down. Yeah. It's, uh, it's awful, but you know what? He's so good and so important to the game. If it would have been, let's say Dom Smith or Garrett Cooper, who did that, you know, they would have like dropped the hammer on him, but they're not going to do that with the golden goose. That's just my opinion. No, not, not right away. At least no way. Now, Dustin, there was a player survey, and this was interesting for Cub fans. The MLB players, right? Not not beat writers, not national reporters. The players were polled and asked which team will surprise people in 2024. And our Chicago Cubs made that list. So if you look right here, the number one team to surprise everyone, Kansas City Royals. Number two, Cincinnati Reds, which I said it was going to to me between the Reds and the Cubs. Third, Detroit Tigers. Fourth, Baltimore Orioles. Fifth, Cubs. So good to see that other players believe that the Cubs are going to have a good team, right? Yeah, it's not a bad thing. I I mean, I'd rather be on this list than on another list. Like which which team will disappoint people in 2024, (laughs) right? You don't want you don't want to be on that list. So I'm much more on the um, on the surprise list than on the disappoint list. I got to ask you a question though. Okay. I'd be, you know, if if the Royals, the Reds, the Tigers, the Cubs, any one of them go deep in the postseason, that would be a surprise, right? That would, that that would be very surprising, but the Baltimore Orioles made the playoffs and won over a hundred games last year. Why would that be a surprise? I guess. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Exactly. You know, I guess you have to define surprise, right? That that's part of this. You have to define surprise. Everybody's everybody's definition is a little bit different, right? Yes, absolutely. Dustin, I I was thinking about you when we got to this story right here about the Wrigley signage. The Chicago Cubs are asking the city council to allow the team owners to stall LED lights signs on two buildings outside of Chicago. They did one of those infamous uh, AI renditions. This is what left field would look like 
And so there would be a big Coca-Cola sign on top of one of the rooftops in left field and a Benjamin Moore lighted sign on the right field. And when I look at these pictures, Dustin, it kind of reminds me of that park in San Francisco, right? Yep. I, I, I was thinking about you and the Toyota signs and all of that. And, and, and what were you thinking when you heard that story? Hey, if this money goes back to the ball club, I'm way, I'm way past it now. It, it, I mean, you, once you start, once you start adding all this kind of signage, you may as well be all in, right? There's no reason to kind of dip your toe in the water. If you're going to do it, which they've done it and everybody's doing it, you know, keep cannonballing and cashing as many checks as you possibly can, in my opinion. Well, Dustin, I do agree with you to a degree. I don't want this to be a NASCAR stadium. I feel I, I, and, and the other thing, take any ads off the field. I know they have the Gallagher insurance company ads were along the lines last year, the first and third base lines, get it off the field. But here's the thing, Dustin, I keep, when, when they started renovating Wrigley and adding these things, people ask me, Crawley, what do you think? Cause they know I'm a traditionalist, blah, blah, blah. But you know, Dustin, I guess the thing that I kind of take a look at, the thing that bothers me is if you're telling me we need these revenue streams, then I want the Cubs to have one of the top payrolls in baseball year after year after year. I don't want to sit there and be like, well, you know, Shohei Otani, too much money. Oh, Yamamoto, too much money. No, we're not going to get Juan Soto. If you're telling me you need these signs and you need this, then do one of two things, lower ticket prices or go after the, the big ticket free agents because if not, then where's that money going? Right. Well, that's just it. Now we have to see how that money is then used. So I, I'm going to, as usual, I'm going to sit and wait and be patient and let's see what they do with it. I mean, you got the hotel, you got the bars, the Cub store right there on Gallagher Way. You have now the, the DraftKings, right? Uh, I mean, these are, you now have marquee, you have massive revenue streams that were unimaginable to us, Dustin, in 2003, let's just say. Let's go back to 2003. I mean, you had none of this stuff. So to me, like I said, either the Cubs should have one of the best payrolls or they should have, they should lower the ticket and beer prices. Something's got to change. Like if you want these revenue streams, fine, but put them into the team. Yeah. Put them into the team. That's what we all want. That's what they always say they're going to do. So we have to trust them uh, on that for sure. Crowley, we got a little bit of uh, breaking news during our podcast. Uh, Cubs and Dodgers have been informed that they're going to open the 2025 season in Tokyo. So tell your wife to uh, book passage so uh, you guys can get out to Tokyo. This is uh, according to uh, our friend uh, Bob Nightingale. Absolutely. Cubs and Dodgers in Tokyo to open 2025. Yep. I'm going to tell my wife to start uh, budgeting for that. I've never been to Tokyo. I have a, one of my best friends actually lives out there. Okay. And so, so you've got a place to stay. I got a place that we could probably stay and, uh, you know, it might be a fun trip. We'll see what happens, but, uh, you know, the Cubs have a, a tradition in, um, obviously in Japan, they played there in the early 2000 against, uh, I want to say it was the Dodgers. So I remember Sosa and Piazza were the two big guys out there. And then the other thing is think about the, the players on each team. If you have the Cubs and Dodgers going to Japan, you have, uh, Shohei Otani, you have, uh, Yamamoto, you have Seiya Suzuki you, and you have Shota Imanaga. So, I mean, like, you know, the four really big Japanese players. It doesn't surprise me that you would have these two teams out in Japan. Yeah, I just, I, I just not a huge fan of that. I mean, I'm always for, with the, the schedule I keep, you know, live sporting events at five o'clock in the morning. I'm all, I'm all for that, but uh, <laughs> this, I'm not, this I'm not on board with. I, I want the Cubs to start here. I, I don't, right. I'm not, I, 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 I don't like this. I'm just being honest. It's just not my, it's just not my thing. I, I, you know, right. They, you worry about the, get, guys the game won't get rained out. I, I'll give them that. The game won't get rained out, but you have to end up worrying about traveling back. And now they said, so they'll, they'll open, they'll open in Japan. Then they're going to come back to Arizona, take a little bit of a breather. Then they will start the, the season um, out on the West coast because that's what you got to do. So, you know what I mean? It's just, eh. It just kind of eh to me. No, I hear you. It, it makes sense, and so we'll 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 see what happens. You you want the guys to get into a rhythm. You don't want them playing two games and then coming home and taking a week off. There's jet lag and all that stuff. But at the same time, like from a business standpoint, to grow the game of baseball, and, and obviously we're seeing the fruits of all those labors from early on with with MLB playing games there. 
um, with all these Japanese players coming into the league. I think, you know, I, I get why they have to do it. It's just, just you would wish it was someone else's team and not your team. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I understand it. Doesn't mean I have to like it. No, but we're going to end the show, Dustin, on a very positive note. Rhino, Ryan Sandberg. I mean, you know, for you, for me, a lot of guys growing up in the 80s and the 90s, this was the guy that we, you know, he was for us, whether it was, you know, either you could say Sutcliffe or Dawson or something, but Sandberg was on pretty much everybody's list as a, as a guy that we all loved. He was the first player I wanted to emulate, try to get his swing down, all that. He put an Instagram post up that uh, talking about his cancer treatments. And he said, round four in the books, great news last week. No cancerous activity in the whole body. PET scan. Thanks to God. Continuing with treatments of chemo and radiation ahead of me. Positive attitude to the max with this news. Takes me back to the early symptoms of back pain and other side effects, which we reacted to quickly with tests to diagnose my cancer. Thanks for all the support and love and positive thoughts. Great news indeed, Crowley. That's great news. And, uh, Hopefully, uh, motivation for anybody that's uh, dealing with it personally or dealing with it within your family that uh, good news can happen. So, uh, great news for Sandberg, great news for Cubs fans everywhere. Absolutely. That's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Of course, we're on all the socials Facebook, Instagram. You can email Crowley and I, fly the W670 at gmail.com. And you can watch us by subscribing to the 670 The Score YouTube channel. Crowley, enjoy uh, opening day. We'll figure out when we're going to uh, drop next, but have a great time. Yep. By the, probably next time we're talking, I'm going to be in Austin, Texas, looking at Globe, or Arlington, Texas, looking at Globe Life Stadium. Dustin, I, I want to thank the listeners, man. This offseason was crazy, and and we've been getting so much support uh, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm just glad the off season's about over cause I'm ready for baseball to get started. Go Cubs. Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!